deconstruction. It's become a bit of a catch-all word. It's become a bit controversial. For me, deconstruction are people that are doing a Romans 12 to mind renewal in this day. Do I still believe what I always believed growing up? And is that the belief system, the wineskin that I'm supposed to take into the next season? My wife is a very logistical, linear thinking person, and she likes to nail me down on exactly what I'm saying. So in our podcast today, Ashley's going to ask me about what are the things that deconstruction truly means to me? And she says, what are those three things that truly denote a deconstruction of your faith as moving forward with God in an uncommon way, as we like to say here with Pastor Paul? This was our live stream we did last Saturday. We do it once a month, and it was such an important and good conversation. I wanted to bring it forward as a podcast. I hope you'll enjoy it and consider it all. And while you're considering what we have to share about deconstruction, deconstruction is a time where we start to say, hey, I'm going to take out my mindset, my belief system, and and I'm going to hold it out in front of me loosely and say, is this what I'm supposed to feel, know, and work from as a life platform for the next season of my life? Sometimes to really know the truth of what we need to know, sometimes to really examine the the buttons that are in us that get pushed to, to trigger us, we need somebody to coach us into really looking into why those buttons get triggered and why those buttons are even there. Maybe we can get rid of the triggers altogether. That's what coaching with Pastor Paul is all about. My core coaching curriculum is online. I do one-on-one coaching and I do it in cohorts of groups of people working together to be their better selves and work through their mindsets in uncommon ways. We'll work on your identity. Who are you? What's the story you're telling yourself? And where does that story come from? And then we'll start to look at how that impacts your mindset, your vision, and stewardship for the world going forward. I've seen lives of people transformed. I've seen people apply for jobs that they never would have applied for. I've seen people change their careers because suddenly they realize they're not working in their passion. They want to go forward into something that really makes an impact in the world. That's what you get out of core coaching with Pastor Paul. An emotional well-being that says, I can be okay on the best of days and on the not so good days as well. You've read the self-help books and you've put them on the shelf. What if we start trying to take those books off the shelf and make them real inside of your core so that you can have a core well-being? Send me a message, DM me. Let's talk about you joining my September cohort with Pastor Paul and my core coaching program. I hope you'll consider it and I hope you'll listen as Ashley and I join together today to talk in uncommon ways on this podcast with Pastor Paul. I think this is a moment where God is revealing a whole bunch of junk that's been in the trunk and it's our like it's our time to um to say yes to him kind of purging out a bunch of junk. So and we're gonna talk some today. I think I I have done a lot of study over the last few years and I'm pretty convinced that the Here. Western Christian church we got a, has a lot of stuff wrong missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Missed it. We really created our own religion that looks very little right. like Jesus of the Bible. Well, so we're going to get to that. Yeah. But I want to also answer. Someone says, "Is this Mrs. Paul?" The answer is yes. Paul and I are married. I am Ashley, and we're coming up on twenty-seven years. August twelfth, yeah. in fact. Um, yep, we will. So it's crazy, crazy. So this is kind of what we wanted to do: is just uh, reflect on the week and um, go back through. If you're hanging out with us here, it means that you're probably following Pastor Paul on TikTok or YouTube or uh, you've seen his content somewhere. And we wanted to just unpack a little bit the stuff that was on Paul's mind this week and that he pushed out there into um, the TikTok verse, TikTok averse, if that's a word. TikTok averse. Yeah. So I wanted to start with a video that you posted early in the week, and it was uh, happened to be a clip from this lady, Melissa Caroni who um, we all met. I actually met her character when Cecily Strong played her for the first time on Saturday Night Live following her testimony, I believe in Arizona. Um, She was a- um, I think it was in Michigan. 
Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. I thought they kind of trout, you know, trotted her around through these different states. But anyway, it was, anyway. It was a state legislature, Rudy Giuliani, like orchestrated Republican state legislature hearing on um, um, alleged election fraud. And so she shows up and she's the character that Cecily like, Strong. Have you checked that report? Have you yeah. checked that report? And um, she, and they mock her as if she was drinking mm -hmm. on <laughs> during her testimony. So anyway, it's that particular lady who is now running for the state legislature in Michigan. Um, heads up to those of you who may um, live there. And, you know, she's talking about the vaccine, that it is uh, very clearly the mark of the beast, that um, the vaccine is made up with of baby tissue. And I thought your comments were really interesting, um, that particularly your point about like, we hope as, as evangelical Christians, we yearn to be oppressed because then we use that as evidence. Like, see, it's the end times. Yeah. And I thought maybe you could unpack for people a little bit more here. Um, like why, why you think the evangelical church is so focused on the end times and what does it do to us? You know? Yeah. Do you want me to play the TikTok or? Sure. Let's see if I can do that real quick. Yeah. Because it's, I think it's a, a very important issue. All right, so let me see. Yeah, crystallize that, crystallize it for us here. Why okay. do you think it's such an important issue? Yeah, let, well, let me run the video here okay. and then, okay, so TikTok, share audio, and then you'll just be able to hear it on TikTok, not see it. So here it is. This is an experiment. Okay, you guys got to hear this. Vaccine that has aborted baby tissue. Crazy, crazy <laughs> conspiracy This theories. right here. A Christian woman running for state legislature. This is, this is solid evidence. We in are the Republican definitely Party. in the end times. Hyper focused on end times. Um, look at what they're doing in other countries. They're they're having they're, they're they're putting people in camps. Crazy conspiracy theories. What do people not understand here? The I hope mean, of is being this, oppressed. I, I, I can't even believe it. A non-biblical view of, of the end times. In the no, it doesn't say um, that. The this, mark of the beast is about Nero and the Roman Empire. Relearn the, the Bible. Right You've been taught crazy um, stuff. It, it is. I mean, there's every sign You're nuts, there. and this is scary, um, Christian. This is an experiment. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. <sighs> WTF. So what is the deal with our focus on the end times? Why um, do we do that so much? I truly believe the bottom line, you know, we've been taught it. It's, it's intriguing. It's, we know something you don't. Is it like the ultimate conspiracy it's theory? It's the ultimate conspiracy yeah, theory. There's an antichrist coming. But I also believe it, it gives us a false hope that, you know, like if you if you worship in, in an evangelical belief system, you're worshiping a harsh God who's holding you up to rules that are unattainable for a human being. And and so you you're so great shame is placed upon you on an ongoing basis. You you looked at the wrong magazine, you thought the wrong word, you listened to the wrong music. When I was growing up, your hair was too long, your sh dress was too short, you, you know, every rule. And so your life is is shame based and the end time said but it's going to be worth it you see all those people that are having fun out there they are going to burn in hell they're going to be left behind they're going to have 666 on their forehead and i won't so it gives us a false self-assuredness that yeah our life is shit because we live in this shame based religious belief system but someday we will get to laugh at those people that are having fun out there right now they think they're having fun but we are going to get the last laugh and i think that is really the ultimate appeal of it is we're going to win you're going to lose jesus is going to come and he's going to beat all of you up my dad is bigger than your dad kind of a thing and it is exactly what the Pharisees believed. The Messiah was going to appear, and those Romans who thought they were so powerful, the Messiah was going to come and overthrow them, and we are going to be in charge. And I believe that is the impetus of end times beliefs today. I think that's it. I think it's like the ultimate, see, we're right. You know, whatever, like, whatever is that thing that is like, it, it, you know, it can manifest in so many different issues or areas of your life from, from you know, little simple tiny things. But it's, it's just ultimately that's like this big power struggle, like we're right and you're wrong, you know. Um, 
And that is, that's the penultimate for like someday we will be vindicated and validated, you know, that, um, that, you know, it's so, yeah, it's, it really is the, it's the heart of this misalignment with this vision of this shame based punishing God, you know, yeah. we all want to be on the winning team. And, you know, I believe it's ultimately the story of the Israelites is, is the true story of the Bible and the character of God is God saying to the Israelites, okay, now you're going to be my priest to the whole world. You're going to get to show the goodness of heaven to everybody. Isn't that amazing? And them saying, no, thanks. What we want is a God like our neighbors have. They pray to their God to kill their enemies. And we want to have a God that will kill our enemies. Yeah. And so, and, and God saying to them, like, do you understand what you're saying in that relationship? Then I have to give you rules and punish you if you don't follow the rules. Yeah, I'll kill your enemies for you, but then you're going to have to follow these really harsh punishing rules. And so this idea of God being a lawgiver and a rule maker and forcing us to follow rules is a man-made concept then and a man-made concept today when instead the story of the entire Bible and of Jesus is if you all live for the common good of one another, love God, love your neighbor, love yourself, that's how you live together. That's how communities and cultures survive as a unit and in a mix of other cultures and communities. And so it's a it's a again a complete misunderstanding and a human desire to I want to have a God that's going to kill my enemies. And uh, yeah, that means he's going to be really harsh to me too, but it's worth it because I want to win in the end. Okay, I have to laugh. This is hilarious. This guy, um, serotonin dog, first of all, says, um, Pastor Paul getting sturdy. And then Pastor Paul off the perks. Off the perks? <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently you're very energized today. Oh, okay. Um, well, just so you know, serotonin dog, I have been keeping track of how many F-bombs Pastor Paul has already dropped in the last 20 minutes. And we're at three and now we're at one S-bomb. So yeah, maybe. Oh, did I drop an S-bomb? Okay. I Yeah, I, I'm being drunk, um, which because I think it's funny. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think. And also, I think that um, you, when we're together, you like to get a little bit feistier. Okay. I think I, I think I feel, I think I'm your inspiration for that. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> All right. I think you bring the energy and the energy flows That's what it is. through what we're That's doing. That's what it is. Um, so David says on YouTube, God does win in the end, but not because yeah. of anything about us. Undoubtedly when the end comes, some or many parts of the church will be in disarray, but he, God is faithful even when we are unfaithful. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Good thought. Um, that's, yeah, that is a really good thought. And I'm also seeing his earlier comment about the veil is lifted. There are differences in what people think is behind the veil. That That's perfectly said. That's exactly what I was trying to say earlier when I couldn't figure out if we were agreeing with the person who was commenting. It's like, yep, the veil is being lifted. But what are you saying? I don't know. What are you saying? Are you seeing the mark of the beast? Or are you seeing the church being cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? And, and I think the, I think the win has already happened. The the win is the battle is over. The job now is and the challenge of the life of Jesus is understand what has been won. That freedom from rules and religion is the point. Um, I think I'm skipping ahead on our points here. Yeah, but that's okay. I go ahead and finish your thought, and then we'll talk about that a little bit more. That part of what we're going to talk about this is my my deconstruction journey to use that word is the idea that Jesus didn't come to create the religion of Christianity. That was not the point. That was what Paul wrote about. That's what some of the other apostles said. And we've taken it and run with that. But if you really read the story of Jesus, his whole goal was to break down religious division lines, racial division lines and nationalistic you know lines that divide us he wanted to break down all the barriers of division of race religion and nationality and say god says i want to pour out my spirit on all flesh i want everybody to know the goodness of heaven so jesus wasn't a christian and he didn't come to make people christian and that is the whole seed change of it all and the victory that was won is 
the religious bondage is broken. The covenant of the Old Testament is fulfilled. That's why Jesus yelled, it is finished on the cross mm -hmm. and says, no more does religion get to reign in the world. And our job now is to tell mm -hmm. the evangelical church, you've created a man-made religion that Jesus didn't intend to happen. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't recognize it if he was walking around yeah. in the flesh today. Yeah, you just said a whole lot. A whole lot. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the, the ball of wax right there. Um, and you were sharing with me last night that you just this week, you seem to have a, an unusual amount of pastors more than normal emailing or DMing you and just saying, hey, what do I do on this deconstruction journey and um, and kind of reaching out for coaching and support. And um, I don't know what it was about this week that that you know, more people happen to that were pastors themselves. But I thought, I thought that was interesting. And I thought, you know, it, I'm a little bit outside, you know, I'm not talking about this every day. I'm not on the social media, like you are like hearing everybody's reaction. So I'm, I'm like a step out one step in the deconstruction world and one step in just like normal life, living my life, right? you know, working, work, a working stiff going to work and all that. And <laughs> trying to raise our family. But um, I so I wanted to hear from you, like, we throw out a lot of concepts like okay. construction. Can you be a little more specific now? You're how many years in would you say to this dis deconstruction journey? Well, it sort of started in when I was in pastoral training. And so when was that? 2000? Well, probably 2006, seven, because we yeah. planted a church in 2008. And even a little bit before that is kind of when I had stopped listening to Rush Limbaugh and started feeling like that was impacting my my spiritual spiritual journey but yeah it, you know learning that there were christian people who didn't believe in the rapture and didn't believe the end times the way i had always been i thought every christian believed the end times as a pre-trib millennialist just like i did and so yeah that was what really started the journey of like well if i've been taught that and that's not true what else do i believe and then, you know, stepping out of leading the pastorate of the church that we started, which was in 2008 on this weekend. Yes, you guys, tomorrow is the anniversary. 2008, August, it was 888 yeah. when we had our first public service for the church that Paul and I planted. The Isn't river crazy? in Fresno, yeah. So how many years ago was that? 18, 18, 18, 18, 19, 18 was 20, 10. 21, 13 years 13 ago. 13 years yeah. ago tomorrow. Yeah. And so when I stepped out of leading that church, it gave me freedom to really start to have my yeah. mind renewed and start to think of, okay, what does this look like today? And yeah, so things just started unraveling in the belief system and they do pretty quickly. When you really start taking a critical look at the evangelical belief system, they start unraveling pretty quickly. So that's that's a good way to put the time frame. So it's been for you easily um, a 15 year kind of process, but the last three years have been really accelerated after serving as a senior pastor in an, um, a charismatic evangelical church and then stepping out for the last two years, three years. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So that's for you, kind of how you mark your timeline. Can you nail down now, like what have you deconstructed from? Like what are the concrete things that you would say I now see this differently and that's a result of this deconstruction and i actually have your answer yeah. right here if you want i think i'm going to go to the second one first <laughs> okay. it is like who is god that that you're taught for um in evangelical ish evangelical ish living evangelical ish <laughs> what am i trying to say evangelical living you're taught that god is this patriarchal father of the judeo-christian bible and any other view of God is is heretical, like any other view of who God is. And, and even if I study the Judeo-Christian scripture, I start to see that God is saying, I will present myself in the way you need to see me, but that is not the whole of who I am. And I see somebody saying there that God doesn't exist, and that's fine. You can have that belief system, but I think that is just as religious a statement as to say, the evangelical belief that they know exactly who God is because you can't prove there is no God. I think there is something bigger than the universe. But if you believe that, that's fine. I'm not here to try to change that belief. And, and that's that's part of what I'm saying, that 
that if if God is different than you know, and and God is willing to present as what it needs to be presented to somebody to feel safe and feel encouraged by interacting with the divine, then that starts to break down the second point of what I believe that as an evangelical, you believe we have the only right belief system in all the world. And our job is to evangelize to that belief system. We need to convince people that they are sinners and come into our belief system. So my vision of God changed, of, of who God is, and God is not this little thing we can put in a box and explain as evangelicals and, or explain in a book that is a version of who God is and what God looks like. And secondly, is I don't have to evangelize people to my belief system. I don't have to convince them they're wrong and I'm right and they need to come into my belief system. So those were the two big breakdowns. And then, so then it's like, okay, so how does the story of Jesus, if I don't have to convert people to Christianity, in the middle of this, then what was the story of Jesus about? And I believe the story of Jesus is an amazing story. And I have people who say, there's no proof outside of the Bible that Jesus existed or very scant proof you have to try to, and I'm fine with that. If if Jesus never existed, I'm not gonna have that argument with you if you believe that, but the story is still incredible. I believe he was a real guy. I believe people's lives were changed because of their interaction with Jesus. But whether you believe that or not is okay. But here's the thing. It was an incredible story of, um, yeah, if people are getting really disruptive, please mute them. I've muted a few myself that if you're just being ridiculous to try to disrupt people, please don't let people be disrupted or made unsafe by by silly people who can't handle the, yeah. the, also, the freedom to comment. I'm really appreciating the technical tip we're receiving from which is what just me being me, you be you mirror mode, tap the three dots and click on mirror a way to go live so that you don't have like print reversed or whatever. So, oh, well, yeah. Thanks for, for making that. Um, How do we do that? Mirror your video, making that tip. Oh, look at that. Okay. Like, literally just blew my mind because <laughs> now I'm looking at a totally different side of my head and yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> now we're really, uh, so point three, the story of Jesus, whether you believe he was a real man or not, I'm not going to argue that with you, whether you believe he raised from the dead or not fine, but Jesus as a representation of the character of God and how we live once we understand that true character of God is an incredible story, a world changing story. And so my view of Jesus as being Christian means to be Christ like, to be a little version of Christ. And so I believe Christian means I need to live life the way Jesus lived life, which is I'm gonna break down barriers. I'm not going to let racism or nationalism or religious exclusivity stop me from loving and valuing everybody around me in the world. The only people Jesus didn't seem to value were religious people who brought religious, racial, and nationalistic division, and, uh, and he had really bad things to say about them. But the foreigners, the, the people of different belief systems, the tax collectors who were traitors to their people, he sat and had lunch with them and loved on them and told them they were good and valuable. And so those are the three changes, just the divisiveness and exclusiveness of my belief system begin to change. And I begin to be able to love people, which is what I always wanted to do. So just to recap, so number one, um, God is bigger than the God of the Judeo-Christian Bible. Yep. Okay. Number two, um, you've stopped believing that your job is to convert people to the the Judeo-Christian version of God. Correct. Right. And then number three, how we look at the Bible and Jesus, the, the story of Jesus, the person of Jesus, that um, Jesus didn't come to create another set of um, rules and religion and chains of religion. Um we did that. Like we, we in trying to model his life or whatever, you know, in the centuries that have since passed, we put all that stuff back on and you're saying, no, no, no. Jesus is the expression of God that says we don't need those rules. You know, like that's who God is. So he totally 
um, reshaped and reformed the um, like the view of God at the time. Right. Yeah. And so that's that those are kind of your three nuggets. And I, I'm curious if those of you who are listening and have been going through deconstruction yourself, if that resonates, if there are other points that you're um, that you would add to that, or like maybe just share a little bit about your, your experience. If yeah. something is different from what you've just shared. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting when people come on and say, "Well, there is no God." I'm like, "Fine, that's your belief." I'm not speaking to you. I'm not trying. It's not that I'm not speaking to you. I'm not trying to convert you to believe in God. I think it's impossible to say there is no God. That is a religious statement in and of itself. That is a faith-filled statement to say there is no God. The universe is expanding. It's expanding into something. There is something bigger than the universe. Who knows what that is? Um, I think there's something divine and I've seen too many incredible things to think there's not something of the supernatural and mystical and, and you can believe whatever you want to about it, but I'm not here to try to convert you to my religion anymore. I'm here to say, how do we live self-sacrificially for one another and for the common good so that we have welfare in our cities, which is the ongoing never ending command of the Bible. Yeah. And I think for me, like, um, where, just practically kind of where I hold these thoughts is like, um, you know, perfect. I mean, God is the source of, of perfect love. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think about what it would look like for me to, to attempt to perfectly love friends, family, neighbors, enemies, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's like, I find myself instead of praying, praying for kind of specific things like, Oh God, please let this happen. Or, Oh God, please let that happen. I find myself in prayer time more just really yearning for that expression of God's perfect love to encounter those situations that are on my mind or things that are heavy on my heart. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's kind of a practice that I'm sensing is a little bit different for me in, um, in this season of my life. Yeah, the, the Christian Bible says God is love, and everyone who loves knows God. And if you don't love, you don't know God. I mean, it's a pretty it's a pretty simple concept. And the religious guys around Jesus didn't love. They they put rules and bondage and they lived in self smug self-righteousness. And Jesus said, when you get to whatever eternity looks like. The answer is going to be, I never knew you. I never knew you. And so this idea of God is love. And I and and I have Christian friends who are like, oh, you just want this touchy feely loving God. And I think loving people is one of the hardest things to do in the world. Oh, you're going the easy route to just this loving God. Like saying I'm right and you're wrong is like the easiest thing in the world. I get to be smugly self-righteous. But to say, like, I have to love people who disagree with me, who look different than me, that's hard. And that's the command of the Bible is to love the people you don't think worthy of God's love. That's the note of whether you're following God or not. Interesting. Yeah. Brody, the dog, says the God of the Bible is not loving at all, though. Well, I think that's because of the way it's been taught and expressed to you, you yeah. know, it's actually, it's actually a different, that's, we see it very differently. Well, and that's that's another point of what has changed in my deconstruction is how we see, understand, and interact with the Bible. That, that the Bible was written by human beings from a human perspective, a group of people that wanted to have a God that destroyed their enemies. And so when they committed genocide, they would say, God told us to do that as an explanation for why they did it. And I think maybe they were they were calling it an act of God when, in fact, it was an act of human beings. And and there's an and and I do also think God works covenantally with generations, and and was working out of that covenant. But that's that's not when what when Jesus came. The story of Jesus is you're acting the way you act because you don't understand the character of the nature of this loving force that is God over the universe. And if you truly understand it you won't kill your neighbor. You won't commit. Not only will you not commit murder, he said, you won't call people fools. Not only will you not um, be pro-abortion, you won't call people baby killers when they do it. Because the the command of love is a much higher standard than the, than the rules of human beings and Christianity. 
So um, if you're just joining us, first of all, um, I really respect that you want to jump on a Saturday and talk about like the questions <laughs> of the universe and all this intense, big stuff that uh, that Pastor Paul's always talking about. But um, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us this morning. And yeah. uh, we're just kind of going back and reflecting on the week and looking at some of the content that Paul posted and and um, kind of trying to tie it all together and, and digest it a little bit together. Um, so we've moved through a couple things so far. First of all, we talked about um, your video that you posted with uh, Melissa Caroni and the, kind of the hyper focus on the end times and, you know, really sort of what is that in the evangelical Christian world that we always want to be in the end times. We always want to be the oppressed. And um, anyway, we spent some time on that. You talked about your own journey of deconstruction and what has specifically changed for you instead of just throwing out global words like I'm deconstructing like okay so what does that mean I tend to be you know, the yeah. practical person in the conversation um in our household and that you mentioned I got hit up by several pastors just this week yeah who were like yeah. oh man I'm what yeah. do I do now the earth is moving under my feet and so so it's it's not uncommon for I mean you chat with people all over the world all over the time that are dealing with deconstruction, it's a little more unusual for you to have pastors. So consistently reaching out, you yeah. know, and, and um, looking for support and guidance. So that was an interesting uh, update from the week. But the third thing, I kind of want to bring it down to just like, again, a little more practical topic. You posted a podcast this week with um, Jay Wilkinson and um, the topic was caring capitalism. He's with the do more good movement. Mm -hmm. I haven't listened to it yet. You've encouraged me that like, I really need to listen. Yeah, this you need is, to hear this one. This is like, this makes me excited to think about reforming the economy and reforming um motivations and interests and like expanding the purpose of business to include purpose, social purpose, as well as sustainability, um, financial and otherwise. Um, but say more about what you guys talked about. And um, I have a clip. Okay. All right. So first, let me play the clip. Some very specific um, text and research that's been done in business circles around understanding that companies that pursue a path to purpose in their business are more profitable businesses that don't understand that they need to evolve the way that they do business to take into, into account all of the people that are part of their ecosystem. My personal opinion is they won't be around. They're not even gonna survive five to eight years because no one will go to wanna work for them Strong finish. Strong, Strong finish. finish there. Yeah. So Jay Wilkinson of the Do More Good Movement, an entrepreneur, uh, successful business person, had uh, sort of a grew up with a basic evangelical background, had an uh, encounter with a religious person from another religion and began to realize, hey, they have something good in their heart as well. And, and begin to explore sort of what that goodness looks like and and started this idea of reclaiming capitalism for good. And then if you hear the podcast, he'll go on to talk about how then when Donald Trump came around and he saw people falling into the, the trap of chasing after whatever caused them to go after Donald Trump, that he's become even more doubling down on this idea that capitalism is good, but only if it's willing to care about the culture in which it thrives. And that the idea that into the next generation, he said in five years, which is a really bold prediction, that any business that's not willing to take care of its employees, take care of culture is going to cease to exist because people won't work for them anymore. And to some degree, we're seeing that now. And there's this whole boomer like, see, nobody wants to work because they're all lazy. And it's I think some people are saying, I'm not going to work for a company that doesn't care about me as a human being. And, I, and, and at some point, uh, I think we should all say, I'm not going to patronize a company that doesn't care about human beings and we can make capitalism to start to impact. And this is really your space a lot more than mine of how do we make capitalism be good stewards? I think stewardship is a word we heard kind of early on in this journey for us. And how do we make capitalism a, a, a business of stewardship that understands its profit needs to benefit the community around it? Well, uh, so I don't know the answer to that, but I think the pursuit is so exciting and compelling. And um, 
yeah, I think it's a generational shift. Yeah. And um, we have plenty of evidence from the last, you know, 50 to 100 years that there's there's more to life, there's more to business, there's more to success, there's more to thriving than what has been narrowly defined for uh, for private businesses, um, you know, for for a long time now. And um, I just love it. I, I think it's a part, it's encapsulated in excellence. And that for me, so you know, I, uh, when I was a kid, I always knew I wanted to go into business. I have undergraduate and graduate degrees in business. And, um, from my earliest days of knocking on doors and selling Girl Scout cookies to today, the work I do in economic development, which is working with whole industries and communities to try to figure out like, how, how do we create excellence and livability in cities and communities? And like, um, I, I love the pursuit of excellence and the business sector brings that, to community issues, community challenges. We can't solve our community problems without including the business sector. But at the same time, um, I think I think business and industry is being called to walk away from this idea that if everything's good for them, then it's just going to follow that everything's good for people and communities as well. That's not been proven to be true. Um, I have had some very confronting conversations with um, business and business leaders like over the years, I've been doing this for more than more than two decades now. Most recently, I was with an industry group uh, in kind of a statewide thing here in California. And, and I just told them like, look, y'all got to stop walking in the room and saying to lawmakers and community leaders and, and policy makers that if things go well, well for business, they will therefore go well for the community, the county, the region, the state, the nation. That's not the whole truth. And um, if you want to stop the government from telling you what to do, then you better jump in and, and be a part of solving some of the very big problems that are in society today and also that are direct results of your operations. So, um, you know, get there first before a legislator who may not have enough insight or experience to really solve the problem tries to solve it for you. So mm. I think that's a I think that's a mandate. I think it is an exciting thing to um to pursue as a business or industry leader and um i definitely i follow jay's point of view like whoever gets there first is going to um prove the concept for other people and um probably experience the reward as well hmm. so if you leave if if capitalism doesn't make it self-caring then then we need mandates from government to get it there. Yeah, the so, mandates fill the, the vacuum yeah. and the void that is not otherwise filled by private actors, whether they be business or community or, you know, nonprofits or whatever. So and then the and the conservative belief is all regulation is bad. Yeah. And 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 it's true. All regulation is bad until it keeps my neighbor from putting a toxic waste dump <laughs> and totally devaluing exactly. my property, you know, taking taking my three hundred thousand dollar home and making it worthless in a moment. Listen, so suddenly regulation is not hey, so bad. Listen now, don't call out my hypocrisy. Let me, <laughs> let, me let me pet my hypocrisy, please. And government is bad unless it passes a law yeah, to ban yeah, abortion exactly. and keep people from voting. Yeah. Otherwise, government yeah. is always bad. So yes, it's it's very hypocritical. Well, I think, and I'm seeing the comment about you can't have capitalism without exploitation. I think um, I think that's the pursuit is to figure out how do you have uh, a successful, effective private sector again, not just for profit, but nonprofit and community, etc. Um, that actually is not extractive, but is renewing, and that. Um, creates hope and vibrancy and does so in a way that benefits, you know, people and communities. I, I it's got to like, what is our choice to just be like, Oh, forget it. You know, we're just no. going to sit in our mess and stew. Like we got to try to figure this out. Probably disappointing to some of my deconstructionist progressive friends. I, I don't, fully agree with the statement that Jesus was socialist or the early church was communist. You know, most of Jesus parables, the reward was profit uh, in the, the parable of the talents or the parable of the minas, the profit brought reward. Um, the story of Ruth, Boaz was an extremely wealthy farmer, extremely wealthy businessman. And he was lauded in the Bible for his generosity that he left the edges of his field 
unharvested so that the foreigners and the and the widows and those that didn't have the ability to work and own could be taken care of and you know the rules were when the gleaners were doing their gleaning everything they dropped they had to leave on the ground again for the foreigners and the and the poor people that couldn't work so i don't think the bible is is a communist manifesto. Uh, I don't think Jesus yeah, I, was was spouting communist ideals. I, I agree, and I would just say, like, I feel like slapping that label on Jesus is yet one more religious attempt. Right. You know, it just happens to be coming from, um, you know, a, a a political philosophical sort of angle, but it's still it's still religious to just be like, oh, Jesus was this, you know. Anyway, so it's, I, I mean, it's the opposite response to that conservative. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan saying government, it doesn't solve the problem. Government is the problem. That's that is a definitive statement. That's not the truth. And so then the then the opposite response is throw out everything of, of government, throw out everything of capitalism. God is a communist or Jesus is a communist is is just the opposite end or the other side of the same coin. We need to live in the tension that um Capitalism has taken a lot of people out of poverty and a lot of the world out of poverty. And at the same time, then it has exploited a lot of people. And without us coming to agreements for the common good of the culture and, and government is our mechanism to do that, um, we will see Standard Oil owning 82% yeah. of the world's oil distribution and, yeah. and ripping everybody off because of it. By the way, I really appreciate um, Therapies' comment that Jesus didn't condemn wealth, but he acknowledged there's responsibility with it. I th and I, I want to um, throw out there, I'm listening on Audible right now to a great book called The Heart of Business. Um, and there's a lot of good comments about like purpose. What is the purpose of business? And I think that's what Jay on your podcast is, is teasing out, that if the purpose is just simply um, one bottom line, financial bottom line, then you get what we have today. And that it is up to leaders in in the private sector, again, not just for profit, but private sector, meaning non-governmental, to say, hey, there might be something better. There is something better out there. Let's push ourselves to find it. To me, that's the pursuit of excellence. You know, an excellence when pursued in an honest and integrity filled way is um, it is transforming. You know, it it it, uh, it does raise and lift up people in communities and it sets a new standard for the other sector. So. I would recommend that book. I'm almost mm -hmm. the way, but it, the, in the book, it talks about how, and this was um, the former CEO of Best Buy. Um, and really he was on a journey. It sounds a lot like kind of our Christian deconstruction journey, yeah. although he did, he's not explicitly uh, talking about Christianity, but like for him, like moving away from the deconstruction of pure profit as motive to um, giving people purpose and like helping people find their purpose and like instilling that in their employees and then watching that purpose be what what has driven the transformation of their business like that's super cool i you know and um i don't know there's just there we cannot throw the towel in on successful private enterprise and also we have got to challenge ourselves in private enterprise um to lead and not be dragged into this space because right. i i think jay is really on to something that we, we won't have private enterprise anymore if we don't um, take the leadership role. One of the things I, I'm i very uh, confrontive of evangelicalism about is taking one Bible verse and, and making a theology out of it. And I hear some of my friends in the, in the progressive space saying, well, Jesus said, sell everything and give all you have to the poor. Actually, he only said that one time to one person. And I think for a specific reason. To, to Zacchaeus, we don't see him saying anything about Zacchaeus giving away all his money. Zacchaeus says, I'm going to pay back anybody I've ripped off double what I ripped off from them. Zacchaeus didn't say, I'm going to sell everything and give all the way to the poor. He said, I'm going to make things right. So again, let's not create a, another theology in the opposite direction out of one verse any more than go and sin no more can be made of an overarching theology for others. But one of the things that's important in this, I think, uh, that I would ask you about is, is haven't we learned that the real problem in a capitalist economy is when is that division between the wealthy and the poor. And that when that gets to be extravagantly large, 
that's when economies kind of get out of whack and maybe ultimately collapse or is that true yeah i mean that that's i'm not i'm not an economist i'm not a historical economist i'm not a, a financial expert i'm really just a practitioner in economic development and um have been so for the last couple of decades so you know i encounter a lot of theory and a lot of data and that sort of thing but that i mean that seems to be clearly what the data suggests and that we're living in this massive, massive, massive time of inequality. And it's not, it's not socialistic or cap or um, communistic to, to say as a private actor, that is a, that's a concern. I, I come to the table understanding the impact of, um, of inequity and, and want to be a party to reevaluating and rethinking um, how we got where we are and how we, how we, change things you yeah. know so anyway i um i don't know i just think it's a real it, somehow it's like when i stop and think about all the different stuff that you talk about and even when we roll in here on you know mentally live like this you know what is the connecting thread to all these dots it's it all is it's all related um, but it almost just seems sometimes so big, you know, we're talking about deconstructing, deconstructing evangelicalism and the sort of modern Western Christian church. We're talking about, by know, the way, Ireland is somebody's with us from Ireland. How fantastic. cool is that? Wow. Well, welcome. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the, like kind of the same, like, like deconstructing capitalism. Um, I mean, these are big epic things and it really to me just points to the very earliest comments that we had um from many of you at the at the top of this hour which was like yeah the veil's being lifted you know that's kind of the way i see it like like we're living in this time of change and um and wow you know in a sense what a privilege and also responsibility to be alive right now and to try to represent the heart of god for people and communities yeah and be a part of reshaping things for the future. I think that's ultimately, you know, the the thread that ties these topics together. Yeah, and the real demand of the Bible isn't um, don't sin, it's don't harden your heart. You know, Hebrew says, don't harden your heart as your fathers did in the desert. And, and to me, a hardened heart comes when no matter where we are on the spectrum, we become convinced I have all truth. And all truth has to come through my belief system. But when <laughs> this arm keeps moving on me, but when we're able to live in the tension of love your neighbor as yourself, that means like we all have to come together and say what works for the common good. And that may mean you bring some of the truth and they bring some of the truth and we bring some of the truth. And when we all get together and can live in the two, the, the nuance of that tension, the two ons, that really good stuff can happen. And two that two ounce is not a bad word, by yeah, the way. Not, we could try to coin that <laughs> right here on Fall and Ashley Live. It, it takes a humble heart to be able to say, maybe I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Maybe I should hear something you have to say in this. Well, I think if that's really what it comes down to for me is that as as I as I'm inspired by and so radically impacted by what I read about Jesus in the Bible and the way, like, my God, he, um, he just completely confronts the power systems of his day and everything that was held sacred that was not reflecting the true character of God. It's like he turned it upside down without regard mm. for who he was offending or whatever. And, um, and then he, you know, died this total sacrificial death. So, when I think about being a Christian, I don't know why I'm getting emotional this, but mm -hmm. when I think about carrying the heart of God for people, it makes me think, how do we position ourselves to live and to love sacrificially with one another? And that happens. It doesn't happen in the church. That happens in community. That happens in society. And so those of us who have been raised to believe like, oh, you know, we got to take our Christian faith into the marketplace. What I'm, what I'm learning is that has nothing to do with like, make sure that Christian people are in charge of stuff. That's gotten us to where we are today. Instead, what it means for me is um, the essence of Jesus in the marketplace challenges me to, to make sacrifices for people, whether I'm a private enterprise and I'm thinking about, you know, um, 
a new business that makes a triple bottom line impact and creates opportunity for people in my community, or I'm a nonprofit leader, or I'm a church leader, or whatever, a governmental leader, it's to me, that's what it's all about is how do you hear people you can't normally hear? How do you hear their hearts? How do you love them? How do and how do you solve problems for the for the collective whole? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's what that's what we are called to be if we are trying to carry out um, a commission of God's love. I think that's what it is, you know? Yeah, our friend Brian just sent us a text there. I saw pop up and he was talking about biblical capitalism. I like that term. You're like, what is what is biblical capitalism? Uh, that well, fits into the pray for the welfare of your community for mm -hmm. in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Probably, okay. I've seen so many like Christian led businesses that think biblical capitalism means they pray at the beginning of the day or they pray in staff meetings and give donations to anti-abortion. Yeah. And it's, it's really, really kind of ridiculous. That right. to me would be religion. How do we do religion in business? That's religious capitalism. That's real. That's it. Jesus. Oh, thank you. Following capitalism is caring about your employees and caring about the people you serve and caring about the, the community and culture in which you exist. And how do we benefit all of those stakeholders rather than just your stockholders? Ooh, I like that. Boom. Stakeholders, not just, not, not just stockholders. stockholders. And you can, you know, you have a fiduciary duty to your stockholders. Yeah, but. And but you need if, to convince them that, that it's important to serve all your stakeholders. And that's if you're, if you're, commitment up front to your stockholders is look we're not just about you we believe in the i mean i i know so many people have you know have modeled this and b corp is an expression of this and like doing well by doing good like you know this isn't a new concept we're seeing this you know hovering around for the last couple of decades if not longer but i just think it's becoming more of a mandate you know yeah. and i do think that's the generational shift um, because we're actually reading the Bible and saying, you know what, this is what the Bible actually says. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I saw somebody who's like, oh, Jesus died for our sins. That is, that is coming from a very thin, myopic, evangelical viewpoint that's not understanding the full story of Jesus and, and not the full story of the Bible. Someday, maybe next month, we'll talk about a really cool project we're doing in the Fresno area mm -hmm. um, that um is putting these concepts into action and like actually trying to blaze a trail of like okay if these are the concepts we believe like we want our economy to work for the residents of our community and we don't feel like it is today what do we do about it like instead of just sitting around and you know throwing stones at each other and saying you're doing it wrong or you're doing it wrong, like what do we do differently and um so we've got something underway i want it to be farther along before i talk to you guys about it but it's kind of exciting yeah yeah, yeah. Hey, so we have been chatting for an hour and five minutes now, All right. and we've had many, many, many um, just awesome folks popping on and sticking with us and um, asking good questions. We've had some lovely little trolls with us this morning. We've had to mute a lot of people that I, can't handle the responsibility of freedom to comment. I always <laughs> feel like, you know, you're over the target when you're drawing fire. So thank you trolls for affirming that we are talking about the right stuff because you wouldn't be showing up and pecking away if you know if we weren't so. some trolls are harmful and some are just silly so mostly yeah. we've just had silly trolls today yeah. um we did have a couple of questions does anybody have a question before we go um rebecca therapies asks is revelation a poetic book not literal um i believe i believe revelation is is written in code um john uh who we believe wrote it or, or narrated it to somebody who wrote it down later was a prisoner of Emperor Nero on the Isle of Patmos, and he was pissed off. And so he wrote just, you know how like, what are the, ace, what are the mother goose? You know, mother goose nursery, rhymes? Nursery rhymes. Nursery rhymes that we used to read as a kid and think, oh, those are so cute little rhymes. Excuse Our dog us. Pudgy joining in. They weren't cute little poems. They were revolutionary <laughs> middle fingers at the king. Did you know that like Humpty Dumpty is the king falling off the wall? I think the king knew it at the time too, don't you? Well, I, I, apparently it was 
the way they got away with doing it was, it was, theater. It was code. And yeah. so John is writing about his hatred and belief that Nero will fall and the Roman Empire will fall. And so he's writing in code. And so he says, oh, and the number will be 666, which happened to be the number of Nero at the time, which was the number on the money. And if you don't follow 666, you're not going to be able to buy and sell. He was writing in code about what was happening in the day. He was not writing about something that's going to happen in the future. You can argue that maybe parts of it are, but much of what we read in Revelation happened at the fall of the Roman Empire and the end of Nero as Caesar. And that's what John was writing about. Matthew 24, which we also use as an apocalyptic prophetic chapter, was writing about Jerusalem's destruction in AD 70. And the book of Mark, or the book of Matthew was written in 85 AD. So it's written after Jerusalem was destroyed and written for Jesus making a description of what was going to happen to Jerusalem. These are not things coming in the future, they're in the past. You're giving me the rap symbol. Yes, I am. I did it under the camera though. So yeah. no one else was to know except for you just aired it. Okay. Anyway, um, hey, I saw someone ask the question, do you have a website where more of your ideas, you know, this person can come and interact with? And that is a great question. The yes. answer is yes, pastor-paul.com. But the answer is also, it's not a great website right now. I mean, it's what we could put together and all that. But um, we are in the middle of a rebrand and a redesign of yeah. Paul's web platform. Um, we want to make the things that he's doing every day, every week, every month, more available and more accessible for people, including his coaching. He's got a cohort coming up. If you're interested in um, a curriculum that Paul wrote and spending time coaching with Paul, you can check out the website, pastor-paul.com. But we're kind of trying to fundraise for this um, for this website, all the stuff that we do or you know, we do on the sides of our desks and lives. And, um, you know, it's our little startup activity here in our home living room. Um, so you can go to Patreon, you can go to Venmo. If you want to support Paul monthly, there are options to do that. You can pay up front. That'll help with uh, a rebuild of the website. It's going to be really terrific. We're working with the local business here in Fresno, super talented lady that's helping us redesign. You can also go to Venmo. Uh, if you want to make a donation one time, or if you want to make a series of donations. Our overall fundraising goal, remind me, Paul, is? $20,000. $20,000. And we've already put in eight ourselves. Yep. So we got, and then we had some fantastic um, donations come in the other day, $1,700. Yeah, $1,700 so, gift came in. You know, yeah. we're almost to the halfway point of the money that we're trying to raise to get this done and get this relaunched. So if this is for you, that's great. If it's not, that's totally okay too. Um, My Venmo is at paul swearengin one um, I think you can get that on the pastor-paul.com website. If you have any questions about any of that, just send me a direct message, send me an email, and uh, and we'll figure out how to make it work. So go check it out. And we, um, we do have a monthly subscription. If you sign up monthly, then you get really cool things like week weekly Bible teachings from Paul, like Part of what we want to do is I did one this morning. a sense of community. Like if you're like, hey, I've never been into church or I don't really feel like I can go back to my evangelical church um, ever since Trumpism hit it. What do I do to have still um, edification and you know ways to continue to explore God? Well, um, this is the best preacher I've ever heard in my life. And um, he preaches now, but it's through a different lens through his weekly Bible talk posts. And those are available only to our monthly subscribers. So that might be an incentive. You can also get a copy of his book um, for signing up monthly as well. So is that a good, good pitch? Am I done? Good pitching? pitch. Yeah. Okay. Just, we, we, we need your help and we haven't, we don't do traditional sort of mission asks. We say, Hey, subscribe and become a part of helping spread the, the message that God's not Republican and he's not mad at the world. And, and he may for, not even be a he. Thank you way. for asking the question. What's your mission statement and primary goal? The mission statement of Pastor Paul, pastor-paul.com is to pursue spiritual health in uncommon ways. So Spiritual um, life, I think it is. But I like that. health too. Okay, let's do that. To Pers pursue spiritual life in uncommon ways. Yeah. Um, so we're in the process of making that really cohesive and easily accessible for folks. Our primary goal is that people would know the love of God and not know the love of God through the crazy, ridiculous filter of religion and politics that the church tends to walk in today. And we know that when that happens, your life changes. And when lives change, 
communities change, societies are transformed. So it is no small goal for us here uh, at uh, pastor-paul.com. Is that all we're doing today? I think that's it. We're at our time and you guys have been so great to tune in with us and we will post this video also on YouTube. So be sure to go on YouTube and follow at, is just search Pastor Paul on- Pastor on, Paul TikTok on Pastor YouTube. Paul TikTok on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, that's a great way to support us as well. All right, you guys have a great weekend and uh, a great month. Thanks for hanging out with us. Bye YouTube. Bye everyone.